Could you please call the roll, please? Mr. Boykin? For the Director of Finance, Mr. Reyes? Present. Ms. Hendricks? There you go. Mr. Keeley? Present. For the Superintendent of Public Instruction, Ms. Zuma? And for the State Controller, Mr. McGuire? <laughs> Chairperson Dylan, you have a quorum. Wow. <laughs> that Ch was chaos. Funny. Oh my god. Chaos. Man. We're gonna this is dangerous. We're gonna put it over here. Right there. <laughs> Hi guys. Hey. Alrighty. Um we will with uh, flexibility um what I'd like to do is do two items from our agenda. Um, that's an open session and then move into closed session and then we would complete our agenda tomorrow. The two items that I would like to do are items number, um, I'll do item number five and then <coughs> number, 12. hang on, 12. I'm, tr I'm trying to find it Jack, I'm sorry. 12, um, number eight, eight. eight, yeah, five, five eight, and then 12, but not necessarily in that order, I guess. That's right. Okay. 5, 12, and then 8. Yeah. Um, so with the indulgence of the board, with that flexibility, I'd ask for a motion to approve the board agenda and the work plan, please. Motion to approve. It's been moved by Sharon and seconded by Pedro to approve our uh, board agenda and work plan with flexibility. Any discussion? <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Alrighty, we have any abstentions? Does <laughs> anybody not want to weigh in on that? Um, we have approved those agendas. So, Jack, we'll move right to you. This is item number 12. Yeah, the CEO report. Uh, so just one, hopefully everyone saw my note. We don't have a need for the May 2nd date on the RFP so for investments. So that is right now uh, not needed as a meeting date. Um, so I just want to reinforce that. And That's then... The 7th, right? The 6th? Uh, I think it's May 2nd we had held. Oh, May 2nd, I'm sorry. Um, and then on the uh, bright side, you know, rarely in the course of one month do we have two major changes here in technology uh, because these projects take a long time and a lot of effort. And as I mentioned, uh, we're ecstatic, but we weren't going to talk today really about um, the um, turning on live business direct, but uh, it is working and we're all getting trained and trying to figure out how to use the new system. So we'll talk in April in much more detail and give you a financial <laughs> report on its implementation. Um, but the second project, not nearly as long in length, but it's certainly an impact for our membership is the refacing of our website since it is, of course, our core communication tool uh, today for our membership. And as you saw in our notes, um, we don't do that often. It's a big deal because there's change management involved and you're used to going to the left for something and now you got to go to the center or the right and people have to get used to that. So you certainly don't want to change your website often, but it had been a while um, since we had changed our website. And there's a lot of changes in in best practices for web design that we want to take advantage of so uh, Krista championed this project for us with her staff and got it done on time on budget our message is here and uh, she's gonna go ahead and just do a quick overview for it because it's so different um, than our other website in uh, in how it focuses the information so I'm hoping our audience takes a look at this if they haven't tried it out and take it away Krista Thanks, Jack. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Krista Noonan. I'm the Director of Communications for CalSTRS. It's good to see all of you. I just, uh, I just gave a demo in the Client Advisory Committee, and I think that's why they were all talking, because they were just saying how much they loved it. So, <laughs> um, But what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to give you a, a personal tour. I'm basically your, your cruise director on the new website. This has been launched, as Jack said, about two weeks now. Um, we haven't really talked a whole lot about the website at this point, because really, when you first launch a website, you want to go through what's called a soft launch so that you can work out any glitches, that type of thing. So, um, But the website is fully functioning. Um, it, it, it looks great. It is a, uh, a departure from what we had previously, and so that's why I'd like to take this time to, to go through it with you. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, the business plan, uh, CalSTRS business plan, called for the redesign as part of the 100-year anniversary. It just so happened to coincide with it. But honestly, it, it, it was time to do it. It had been 10 years. The last time the site had been redesigned was in 2003. 
Um, so over that 10-year period, the content was always regularly updated, but the basic structure and the branding format and so forth was always the same. Um, so what we did, we, uh, my team, along with an external vendor, we embarked on the redesign project in July of 2012, and we did all of this in uh, six months. So, and what you're talking about is it was roughly a thousand pages of content that we have narrowed down to 400 pages. So it's still very, very information intensive, but it's much more focused uh, to meet the visitors' needs. So, um, and just to give you a, a more background. Um, this, this is quite a departure from what we had before, as I mentioned, but what we found is the previous homepage was very information heavy, and, and we found that a lot of times when people would go to the site, they would at first look at it and kind of, you know, okay, well, they, they'd see the left-hand navigation, but they really wouldn't know where to go. Uh, when they tried doing searches, the, the search capability was there, but it wasn't as fully functioning as it is now. Um, so we've, we've updated that functionality. Um, and really what the point of doing the, the redesign, what we kept in mind is we really want to actively engage with our audience of all ages. So as, as you know, CalSTRS membership, for example, spans multiple generations, multiple age groups, and various different stages in their careers. So our goal was to, you know, how can we increase that engagement and make it appealing for all of the visitors? Um, in addition, not just our members, but our stakeholders, business partners, uh, the media definitely pays attention to our website, and the general public, of course. The other thing, just so that you're aware, Technologically speaking, the former website, um, the, the technology was pretty much outdated and it was very cumbersome to work with. So the new technology is, is much more in line with current web technologies that are out there. Uh, the content management system is just beautiful. My staff can go in and it's very user friendly, so they can go in and instantaneously change things. So for example, just this morning, we changed the graphic. Uh, you may have seen a previous graphic when you loaded the page uh, in the past. So uh, we made that change in about 10 minutes, I think it took us. So it's, it's very nimble and, and, um, and agile. So um, like I said, what we did when we, when we launched the redesign is we looked at our website usage um, analytics, and we looked at the um, site visit patterns. And from that site visit patterns, we are actually able to somewhat determine who the majority of our visitors are. And, and we are determining most of them are members because of the pages that they're going to. Um, some of the most accessed pages are the calculators, um, the benefits pages, but then the board pages are definitely accessed quite frequently, investments. From there, we could see that it's not just members, but they're pretty much the majority, but there's also the business partners and, and, um, and stakeholders as well. So, as you can see, the, the new site is very much so navigation-centric. Um, it features various tools uh, right at the, your fingertips to be able to, um, to explore the site. I do want to point out this link at the top. I'm not going to click on it because otherwise it'll start the video. But I would encourage you to, to watch the video tour of the newcalsters.com. Uh, my site, or I'm sorry, my staff put it together. They did a, an exceptional job. It's about three and a half or four minutes long. Um, but the, the whole team put it together and, and I just really love it. I think it's a, it's a good overview if you forget what I've told you. And like I said, this background image is um, changeable. So we will, you will see it change frequently throughout the year, we're also looking at changing it um, perhaps when a new visitor comes to the site so that they see an image when they first come to the site, but then perhaps if they go in a week or so, they would see a different image, that type of thing. So we're still working out how we would rotate that image. But as you can see, when you first load the page, this is the home page, you see this quick links access bar. These, we were really trying to identify the most used pages on the, the site from the site analytics, as I mentioned. <clears throat> Excuse me, so we determined MyCalsters, calculators, these, these are the most accessed pages on the site, so we wanted to make them as quick as possible for people to get to. And I should mention, we have links to MyCalsters placed throughout the site. Our, our goal was all about convenience with this new site and not having to, well, gosh, I don't remember where I can get that MyCalsters link because we have it in so many different places. It's right here. We have it under I would like to log into my Calsters. And we also have, I'll show you in a second, we also have it under the members section. So there's several different areas. So as I mentioned, the, the site has been organized into seven different content rich areas. So previously on the home page, like I said, if you saw a lot of content, that content has all been organized into these buckets. And when you click on them, they expand and that's where you can see all of the information organized for that particular area. 
So just for example, let's look at the, uh, the members, let's look at the defined benefit. So if I'm a, a member and I wanna learn more about my defined benefit, there you go, I, I have all the information right here. I can watch videos. These on the right side, these are called pods. So we can easily change these pods with different information based on whatever is, is pertinent at that time. So for example, it's tax season, so we have the tax link up. But for example, perhaps during the springtime when it's peak retirement season, we may put a link to the workshops that are coming up because then people can easily access those. Um, and like I said, the links are in other places on the website, but these are just different tools that we have to call them to attention um, more easily. So, uh, and like I mentioned earlier, we have this I would like to drop down menu. This is also completely customizable. So we will be meeting with the contact center about every month so that we can talk with them about what the most frequent calls are that are coming in, and then we can actually customize this, like I said, to again, enhance the convenience for people to be able to find information right away. So I also wanna show you the search tool. Oops. So the search tool is, is much more enhanced. So for example, if I come to the site and I just, you know, I don't, I don't wanna explore any of the buckets or anything like that, I just wanna search for the pay dates. So I put in, <clears throat> excuse me, pay dates, it automatically brings up the, the topic, but then it also, say I searched for something, but it didn't automatically display on this side exactly what I was looking for. But I knew that, for example, uh, it ran in 2011. You know, I remembered that it ran then. So this information archive on the right side is a huge enhancement that we never had previously. It's, it's great. So you can actually drill down to exactly which area you're looking for and find it. So under employers, you know, it's, it's, um, so it's, so basically it's, see, it's picking up keywords based on your search. So this is a, this is a really great enhancement. In fact, we used it in the CAC meeting earlier and, and found some uh, really useful information. So you can do that for any, uh, any term. For example, earlier we searched on the uh, comprehensive annual financial report, um, and found it on the website. Um, if you weren't familiar with where it normally is posted. So a couple of the tools I wanted to show you, um, this in particular, this is actually a rotating carousel. I should have pointed this out earlier. Normally this will have about five to six different articles that will appear in this area. And you'll see little round circles on this side that signify how many topics are included. And it'll rotate through those topics. But during board time, we've made the decision to freeze it to only display the board because it's so that ease of, well, <laughs> Uh, ease of access and, and making sure that people can go right to this link and they can see your video stream and, and read the meeting agenda. But normally, like I said, this would be a, a rotating carousel with information. As far as if someone um, was looking for board information and it wasn't displayed as one of the, uh, the carousel items, then they could click on uh, About Us and then it's under Teachers Retirement Board. We have the meetings archived through 2010 so all of that information is, is on the website and uh, the agendas and so forth. The other thing I'd like to show you is under forms, uh, I've actually opened it already in a different tab. So the forms ordering system was one of the most popular um, tools on the website previously. Um, it's, it's really convenient. Um, for example, if you wanna go through most requested forms and look at doing an address change request, you can order it through this system by just clicking you know, how many quantity you need and then you'd go down to the bottom and hit next and it would ask you to populate your information. Or as, as Peggy Plett noted, definitely go into to Mike Halsters <laughs> to submit your address change request, that's even better. Um, so that's another example um, of a, or an improved tool that we have as part of the website. The same thing with the calculators. Um, you can go on and, and um, estimate your monthly retirement benefit. All of that is still the same as what it was, it's just better. It's just Im improved on the new website. I couldn't hear you, Sharon. The meetings archived up to the most recent one on the website? You said, oh, we two, you said it's 2010. 2010. So 2010 to present. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I didn't, I was. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's through 2000. And then we have it. the okay. other ones. <laughs> if, if someone would like to request, Just making sure. uh, if someone remembers a, a board meeting from 2007, they can actually go through our staff to request uh, obtaining that, that information. 
The other thing I wanted to mention, given it is our 100 year anniversary, we have a special page on the site specifically dedicated to the 100 year anniversary with a really great, I, I don't know if you've seen this, a beautiful photo gallery. Um, we actually put out on our social media as well as on the website, a call for um, interested members and, and members of the public to submit their historical information about either themselves or their favorite teacher. So we've launched this photo gallery, uh, and it's just, it's beautiful. There's, I mean, there's only a couple, I think there's about 10 different images that circulate through this, but we are going to be adding additional ones as we receive them. We have, we have much more than this, but we're still in the process of adding them. And we've also done, thank you for those of you who have participated, we've done videos where you've commemorated your favorite teachers, and those are also featured um, on the page. Uh, we've, we're also, like I said, doing a lot on, uh, so here's the videos. Um, so it's, it's, I'm, I'm so excited with what the staff has done and, um, and just, just really thrilled with the progress. Um, so going back to the homepage, I wanted to let you know, as always, you know, we have our, our contact information, our frequently asked questions. That is, that is a really intense, um, information rich area of the website. Um, it has so much valuable information. So I, if you ever have a question on anything, I mean, there's so many topics, it's most likely addressed in the, the FAQs, um, but again, you can use the search tool as well. Another thing I'd like to mention is the integration of uh, calstersbenefits.us. That was our, um, what we called the member benefits site, which was developed um, about three years ago specifically to address the plan funding issues. But what we've done is we've um, enveloped that site under calstars.com now, where it has its own tab called plan funding, or bucket, if you will. But if you enter, calstersbenefits.us in your URL address bar, it's going to take you directly to this page. So there were concerns because a lot of people had the calstersbenefits.us site bookmarked on their computer and we didn't want them to get an error when they loaded it. So we developed this page in particular to take the place of that previous site. It still has the same information, it still has the, the um, fact center, the Ask Jack um, CEO uh, questions where people can submit questions to, to Jack and he'll answer them, as well as his CEO blog. And people can subscribe to the Calsters Outlook e-newsletter as well. Um, one thing I do want to mention as well, um, this site is completely mobile friendly at this point. So you can go on on your, any smartphone device um, or your iPad or any other tablet device and you'll, you'll see the site. But I am really excited to, to let you know that we are in the process of developing a mobile version of the site. So what that means is I'm not going to call it an app because it's definitely not an app, but it takes on a lot of the qualities of an app. And the difference between the two are a mobile site is, is a mobile site, but an app is actually developed based on whichever platform you're using. So it's a native app, for example, where it would be developed for an iPhone or developed for an Android, and people would have to go to the app store to download it. But this is not that way. This is a mobile version of the site, so people can bookmark it, and it'll perhaps look like an app on their phone, but when they launch it, it works on any platform. So whether you have an iPhone, an Android, it'll still work. You don't have to download a separate version for what you're using. So that should be deployed probably in late April or May of this year. Um, and last but not least, I do want to thank um, all of the communications staff who have been working on it. Um, Chad Christman is here in the audience, and uh, he's been really leading this project, as well as Mike Gomez in our project management office. They've both been great. We couldn't have done it without the IT and network staff, as well as uh, research and development. Um, they helped us with navigating through all of the like I said, 1,000 pages of information to narrow it down. Um, and our external vendor is actually local here in Sacramento. It's digital deployment. Um, and together, we all worked on doing this in six months. It's a, it's a huge task. And uh, I think there were a lot of people who thought we couldn't get it done, but we did. So I'm excited. Any questions or feedback? You know, I actually had a chance to go through it last night. I was just playing with it. And, uh, you know, the, the video tour just takes you to YouTube and goes through this. And I thought it was fantastic. I was, I'd gone to the other site before, and I went to exactly what you're talking about. It's like, I don't I don't belong on this web mm -hmm. because it's I'm either an employer or an employee, and that's, I'm done, and uh, or retiree. And with this one, you can actually, there's a lot more stuff that as a general member can go in there and look at stuff. And then certainly... My calendar is for members, but there's a lot of good stuff in here. So I commend you and the staff who were involved on this. Thank Kudos. You. Thank you. 
That was Mike Cecilia's cheery voice on the oh, video. If you're wondering who can be that slicker. cheery, but Mike Mike does that for us. He's a former uh, professional broadcast voice. So we bring him in on the. Yeah, I had you know I went all over the place with them, different buckets and different sites and. And my wife, thought, my wife thought I was weird, but you know, I was like, "Yeah, this is really cool. I, I haven't seen this." Yeah, so. that's great. And like I said, I, I can't emphasize enough using the search tool um, because I think that that really came across in the client advisory committee as well. Because we were, you know, a lot of things that even I didn't know where exactly they lived on the website. We just searched, and there they came. And I was keeping my fingers crossed that it, that it actually worked, and it did. Well, given the time I spent reading the material for the meeting, she finally said, "Get a life." <laughs> okay, she didn't say that. I'm if you do, uh, if you go to the uh, hundred year, uh, go back to the hundred year for just that video that is featured there. I would, I'd love for you to watch it at your leisure because that's featuring uh, Rebecca. What's her last name? Mil Milwaukee. Milwaukee, and she's the national teacher of the year that we honored at the NCTR meeting. So she's a teacher in Burbank, and so it's a, and she's very good. So so was, she did this video with uh, Krista and her staff for, for our website. It's not a, not a canned video. Um, so there you go. And uh, again, we want to underscore, it, it shows you how different websites have come in the, in the past. You know, if we discussed this eight years ago, it would have been, how do we feel about that? What do we think is important to be on this website? Now, data-driven analytics, all these tools measuring how people are looking, how often they're on a page, what page they go to. You know, we get away from these intuitive uh, conclusions and really using the data to design the website. So it's much more responsive to customer needs. Um, what we're doing. So we're really happy about it. We probably won't do this again for seven years, but uh, <laughs> but we'll, and I should have said, uh, apart from the mechanics of all this, Ed staff in our R&D area really worked hard to update the content. It was, a, it was an opportunity for us to make sure, is every page accurate? How we describe the benefits and all these things that have changed over time. So this went through a thorough QA cleansing, not just getting a, this technological in innovation here. So that was great for us. And that's, that's really great that you mentioned that too because the, the really nice thing about the website is that my staff now has the ability to instantaneously update it. Um, for example, Ed called us, uh, I think it was about two, week, two weekends ago, but it was on a Saturday and he said, oh gosh, I found something you know needs to be changed because of the pension reform legislation and we, we updated it just like that. Yes, so yeah, but we, <laughs> but we did it right away and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's really nimble, yeah. Here. Krista, I was just going to mention that I did get some feedback from, from a my, couple of the members in Los Angeles that were, in the past, it was hard to search sometimes. And I think they, they'd commented when they went on it last week. Because I sent out an email because I was actually going on the website and all of a sudden I was like, whoa, it's different. And so I'd sent an email out to folks in, uh, on my campus and said, hey, check this out. And so a couple of people had mentioned, because a lot of people were interested in airtime, you know, back in December, not now, of course. but. Um, and um, other issues, and it was hard for them, you know, to mm -hmm. figure out how to get there. And I'm really, I'm happy about our, our search engine that we can mm -hmm. kind of, because I do that a lot of times. You just want to throw in three words or Me something too. and mm -hmm. find something. And right. it just, it's so much more user friendly now. And so uh, I know I've heard back from members how much they appreciate that. So it's really impressive. Thanks That's for all your hard work Great. and all your team. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Jack, anything else? Uh, not on that. Thanks, Krista, mm -hmm. very much. Thank you. Well, no, the last thing I wanted to mention in my CEO report, unfortunately, is a, is a sad thing. Um, unfortunately, we have to acknowledge the departure of one of our key members of the executive staff who's retiring, as you know. But since this is our last board meeting with Janice Hansen, uh, I think I want to just, uh, although, <laughs> although we told you several months ago, getting ready for this moment, this is her last time with you. And although a gigando Winnebago is awaiting her somewhere and down the Delta, um, she is still working hard through the final month with us. Um, you know, what's interesting about Janice, I do want to say two things about her, is that we've done so much technology this last seven years from actually just reinventing the technology spine of our entire organization in this building to things like the website or bringing on business directly. And if you didn't notice, usually it's the business person that's talking to you in this room, whether it's Krista that just did this or Robin who's been walking you through Business Direct over the year or Lisa Blatnick going through the building innovation. And that is so reflective of Janice's approach to technology with us is that she's been a partner to the business areas and the business areas drive the decisions what really meets their needs. It's not the technology people running the engine of the train and we're trying to catch up learning all that pieces. So she hasn't always been here making speeches to 
you in describing items because she's been that backbone to each of these people's program areas. And uh, that isn't always the case with technology executives, you know, where, where they have a different center stage in an organization, they drive the, the structure differently. But the, her approach has always been the business areas have to be the speaker and the driver of these changes. So I, I think we have greatly benefited from her eight years on the executive staff with that approach to the business. Um, but interestingly enough, when I asked her what was the, uh, her most important accomplishment, it was none of the stuff I just told you at all, um, which I think most of us would have latched onto. But I'm going to read it to you, if you remember Janice. Of all the things that I've done at Calsters, I think the virtuosity program was the most gratifying experience. This program has the ability to foster a positive culture of appreciation at Calsters that will live on long after I'm gone. The many staff that played a role on the Recognition Council that developed this program can be very proud of themselves. I love how it is tied to our values and core competencies. Um, so that shows you just how rounded Janice has been as an executive, not just with the technical aspects of technology or the big accomplishments of changing this organization, but making sure that the employee culture here um, really is a rich culture of appreciation and recognition. And you know that program with others that supported it uh, went on to win the best program in the entire country. Um, so it may well be her, her best accomplishment here, but you know, it's, it, we've, there's no lack of strong personalities on the executive staff that are driven with lots of good ideas. But I will say Janice did have a special chemistry in the group that probably led to balance and thoughtfulness that may not have kept us centered as we should be on some decisions. So um, she will be sorely missed in the organization, but I know she's got some great plans and the, the engine's running back there in the uh, Winnebago and ready to take her to a lot of places. But um, I just want to make sure that you all hear that major contributions. So. And the next item lunch, is Janice's that we're well, going to close the day with. Well, and, and, and Janice. I, I knew I was successful in our project management office when Ed Derman asked for a project manager for one of his projects. <laughs> Not everybody on this board knows how tied I was to my board book and my flags and all the other stuff that accompanied my paper board book. Um, so Janice, uh, thank you for helping make my transition to the iPad uh, <laughs> pretty painless because I went cold turkey and I've been at it ever since, huh? Thank you very much. We appreciate it. So Chris, Janice, and, and Graham, take it away. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm here to present uh, Grant Thornton's regular oversight report on the Business Renew projects. Uh, report today is based on our final reports from the month of January, although as usual things move pretty fast around here, and so there are things I'll be talking about that have happened just in the last, you know, five to ten days. Um, let's start with Calm. And yes. <laughs> as I assume you're all aware at this point. Um, Ah, uh, well, <laughs> let, me, uh, let me talk about that. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, as you're aware, our release one of Business Direct went live on the 28th uh, of January. Our system's now in operations, being used by a number of people across the organization. So uh, to date, we're not aware of any significant issues with system functionality in terms of, you know, the actual software not working. Uh, there have been some issues uh, in starting up with user roles and some people not necessarily getting access to their particular um, functionality that they require. That's part of what the project's working through now. Uh, and in addition, um, the project is still catching up on the backlog of transactions from January that accrued over the month after they turned the legacy systems off. So those are being uh, loaded into the system right now. Um, I think from our perspective, we're probably about a week or two away from understanding for certain whether it's been a successful deployment. That would be tough. Because... <laughs> The system has to get through a full monthly cycle. So we have to see all of the major in, inbound and outbound interfaces go and work, and then run a month end close to close out the month of January. And if that runs OK, then I can think we can say, yes, we've had a successful cool. deployment. So you know, watch that space, I guess. Um, 
In the run-up to the deployment, I guess we had two main observations um, with the project. The first was um, approval of the diligence that the project team took in executing the testing and how seriously they took their responsibility in making sure that the tests passed before the approval to go live was given. You know, there's always that pressure to flip the switch. Um, but the project team was very diligent in making sure that the testing um, was executed and they got the appropriate documentation and people knew what they were signing up to uh, when they approved a test. Um, so they thought that was really good. Um, we did express some level of disappointment that the, um, the level of project management discipline sort of died off in the last month or two on the project. And we understand the, you know, the all hands to the pumps attitude where we've got to get the software working and get it ready to go live. But we did feel that a more disciplined project management approach going into the last couple of months probably would have led to a smoother transition. That said, the system's live. Um, our main, rec main recommendation at this point is that as the project is getting into the planning for release 1.5 and release 2, that those project management disciplines be reinstituted to the, to the extent that they were in the fall. Um, and the, the project team who's doing the planning agrees you know, that they have to do those, uh, do those things. So in the next month, we're going to continue to look at the rollout into production and going through that first full monthly close activity. And we'll be focusing on uh, the planning activities for release 1.5 and release 2. Um, release 1.5 planning is starting right now. And the intent is that release 1.5 will go live in increments over the course of the spring. So that's the summary for Calm. Any questions before we move on? No one's online. OK. So let's move on to Pension Solution. Uh, there's been a lot of activity on the Pension Solution uh, project. The requirements development has proceeded pretty much on schedule. Um, there is a decent likelihood that the, um, the RFP issuance date is probably going to slip by a few months um, compared to the original schedule. We don't see this as a big issue because the project team isn't running against a you know a hard deadline to have the RFP out. It's more a matter of doing the right thing and getting the right RFP out. And we think there's still a good chance that the, uh, the project will be able to award a contract uh, around the time that they were originally planning. The market research sessions are complete. Those are a set of presentations that happened in the you know, November, December time frame. And there's a summary report that's been written up on that. I think all of the participants, ourselves included, think those are very valuable. And there's probably a lot of good information that can be used to inform the request for proposal. Uh, and a request for information is currently being drafted with the intent of uh, releasing it before the end of the month. And the idea behind the RFI is to get some more formal feedback from potential uh, bidders on the scope of work, on the form of the contract, on the terms and conditions of the contract, and also to allow them to see the draft requirements and provide some feedback on those before they're finalized in the RFP. So our focus in the next couple of months will be, first of all, validating that the responses that the, uh, the pension team receives on the RFI are leveraged to, reform, uh, to inform the request for a proposal. And then the procurement strategy and timeline for the pension solution procurement is in development right now. So we're going to be reviewing uh, that strategy for you know, completeness and adequacy, as well as the uh, this timeline for the procurement to make sure it looks achievable. Any questions on pension solution? Yep. Okay. <coughs> okay, and then data preparation. Uh, so an update just from the last week. The, um, so the data preparation, uh, data analysis services contract has been awarded. Uh, it's been you know delayed a couple of times, but the uh, the vendor is now um, at work and on site. Um, our focus now is really assessing the project plan and the methodology and approach that uh, the vendor uh, is developing, uh, and to, to also identify any potential dependencies with other business for new projects, either scheduled dependencies or contention for resources, for example. Uh, one particular risk that we'd identified in prior months, and I've talked about before, was a concern that if the data analysis project was delayed far enough, then its schedule might impact the pension solution uh, project, based on the fact that we now have uh, an awarded 
contract and given that the you know the, the, the way the pension solution timeline is looking I think that's relatively unlikely and at this point we don't see it as a big concern that the data analysis project is going to cause any kind of delay to the pension solution project okay, okay. any questions on data prep anyone nope okay well that's all I have thank you Graham thank you I okay, just so want to add one thing um, Peggy has just um, hired the um, business lead for the data prep as well as another uh, full-time um, business person assigned to our care project and that was um, the team that's going through and fixing some of the problems that they had identified in the system and they picked two really really good people and I'm just ecstatic that they're gonna have great leadership for this project Super. Thank you. And, and thank you Janice again you're welcome. Appreciate it. Say good night. Good, good night, board. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, before we adjourn for the evening, because um, I will probably forget to do this tomorrow, we have one other person to thank, and uh, that's Paul. Paul, can you stand up, please? Thank you, Paul. Um, Paul, for those of you that don't know, Paul's been our sound and technical. Um, one of our sound and technical gurus for the board um, during our board meetings. He has accepted a position elsewhere in the um, building, and so we won't get to see him, but uh, he'll still be doing good things for us, and we really appreciate that. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. You're welcome. All righty, that said, we've got a full agenda tomorrow, but we're going to get to bed early tonight. Thank you very much. We'll see you all in the morning. So before we even begin, I'm going to embarrass one of our audience members. Gary Lyons, would you please stand up? Oh, my God. Gary Lyons is former investment committee chair, chair of the board, longtime member of this board, and we like having him back in the audience. Thanks, Gary. And I hope I don't blow it, you know, right in front of you. That could be scary. All righty. Jennifer, if you could call the roll, please. You really don't need a roll, but if you want one, I'll call it. Yeah, let's do it just in okay. case. For the, ooh, threw myself off. For the state treasurer, Mr. Boykin. Here. For the director of finance, Mr. Reyes. Here. Mr. Lawson. Here. Ms. Hendricks. Here. Mr. Rosensteel. Here. For the superintendent of public instruction, Mr. Zeiger. Here. And for the state controller, Mr. McGuire. And Mr. Keeley? Present. Chairperson Dylan, you have a quorum. Thank you, Jennifer. All righty, we'll pick up where we left off uh, yesterday. We have approved our um, open session action item number five. They'll put us right at six. So, Ed, do you want to tee this up or do you want me to? How do you want to handle it? Well, sort of just um, for everyone who's sort of on the same page, you know, we had, there's a, a, a version of the report um, which we had sent to you and we have hard copies, I think, in front of you and also for the audience um, that reflects some relatively minor clarifying changes that have been suggested by um, board members and then also staff went through it again and just sort of found some things we thought would clarify some of the discussion. And so, um, and then also in the back of it, the very end was the letter from um, Milliman that was referenced in the item. And so I guess what we would suggest is perhaps sort of, you know, have, if you want to sort of walk through and see if there are any remaining concerns or any other suggested changes to make so that we can finalize the report right. and get that the legislature? I, I know that um, I contacted Ed um, when the first presentation came out. Um, some of uh, what I've asked, some of my thoughts have been reflected in the new one. I know Paul is also, so I'd like to open it up for anyone else if anyone else has thoughts. I you know, just add one more thing on the finish line, so just to get to the total finish <coughs> line. When you finish today, hopefully everything's straightforward and us to, we can make the changes. Our communication staff really will work on the weekend to really get it into a, a, a good presentation format so it looks good as a final report. So we would be able to make the, the deadline coming up of February 15th and we'll transmit it to every legislator and the governor's office and Department of Finance and all of our stakeholders that are participated. We'll be putting it up on the web 
Um, even though I'm sure you've already noticed the media has taken advantage of your transparency and well reported the draft uh, in many papers and in some editorials, so it's already gotten some initial uh, recognition. But we want to make sure people realize that would be the final report. And then our expectation is the legislature would be conducting a hearing in, in uh, mid-March um, to discuss the report. All righty. Thank you. I'll open it up for discussion then. Fedra? Good morning, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll, I'll start out by, you know, um, although I represent the Department of Finance, um, I, I do, I'm, I'm here because of my position and the Director of Finance has a seat at the table here. I've made it very clear that I try to maintain an arm's length with my role as the fiduciary of the board <laughs> and, the, and the Department of Finance to the point that when we had one of the uh, working groups with the, uh, the meeting mm -hmm. with the interested parties, I asked staff that the, with the stakeholders, I asked staff that they, they put a, a spot for uh, one of my colleagues from finance who's been working with them because I don't want people to think that I was representing finance anymore that I want people to think that you were representing CTA. Yeah or sharing community colleges. We are, we are, have a fiduciary role. So in that fiduciary role, that capacity, I think that, you know, there's a lot of stuff in this report that, you know, anybody can nitpick. But I'm, I'm just going to focus in terms of my view as our fiduciary. And from my view as a fiduciary and what the legislature is asking us to do, I think from our fiduciary role is we ought to push for full funding, 30 years, today, not tomorrow. And, and I think that's, you know, it's, and by that I mean as soon as possible, quickly. So I, I don't support some of these statements that are made, or in fact, I ask, actually seek clarification. In some areas, we say CalSTAR's expectation that any, it has always been CalSTAR's expectation that any increases in contribution rates would be gradual. Given what I just said, I would disagree with that. Taylor, can you refer to? Yeah. <clears throat> I'm looking at. If it's the revised okay. Uh, on this one, on page two, two of uh, of the uh, <laughs> yes, two of uh, cross off twenty four. A delay in addressing. So at the bottom paragraph, it says a delay in addressing the DB program funding shortfall places the program at greater risk particularly there should be another substantial market turndown. Nonetheless, Caltars recognized that the election of the governor may decide to increase the contributions over time. Gradually. Okay. And so I don't know that we, I, I haven't voted on that, so I don't know that I recognize that. So in, in, a, in, a, in a prior page, it's clear on page one at the bottom paragraph, it's clear when it says, the most effective means, blah, 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 blah. And then at the last line, it says the Calsters board. So I like that clarification of what the Calsters board does or thinks. I'm concerned when we say Calsters recognizes, is it Calsters management that recognizes? And so I would like clarification that is not the board that seeks gradual increase. Because we also say the same thing on, on, Page 17 of Cross 24, under paragraph 4, establish the speed of contribution rate increases. The second sentence, is, it says, it has always been CalSTAR's expectation that any increase in contribution rates would be gradual. It hasn't been my expectation. So I just want to be clear that as one board member, that's not my expectation. I just one comment. To, I, I would just, from my view on that one point you made uh, about the board, and I think that may just be a drafting comment. Uh, it would be my view is the report should always be a holistic representation of the system. It would be nonsensical to have staff positions or management positions and board positions in a report. It would just be ridiculous. I mean, the legislature could not deal with such a process. So, I mean, we, it, however you resolve it, I think right. it should be one a one-voice report. So that's why I bring it up, because if, if the, the communist has always been counselor's expectation, this is going under this member's view here. And so it's this 10, ten people, and not the new three people that come out. And it's not what was discussed back in, you know, eight years ago. 
So this is this is a conversation that we have had with stakeholders, and you have had with stakeholders. And so I would prefer that this reflects the view of this board. And I may very well be in the minority, and I get that, and that's fine. But to say that you know Calster's expectations, because I, I don't think as a fiduciary that should be our expectation. Our expectation should be that you do the funding. The, the governor and the legislature will then decide what it is they want to do, what they, when they want to do it, what they can do. But I don't think that is our role as fiduciaries to, to go there. And, uh, so, so, Pedro, I'm going to go ahead and open it up for discussion on the point you brought up. Mm -hmm. But I need you to help me find where the second point is. Because the first on page, on page two, we took out uh -huh. Calster's expectation. We did take out expectation. But that language is still on page 17, and I can't find it. Well, it okay. Dan, it's, it's on the first paragraph under the number four, where it says establish the speed of contribution rate increases. It's it's like the second sentence, and and if I can just a clarification, I I think it's entirely that we just missed that reference to it because we clearly changed the reference in the executive summary. Um, so, I, I if I can just sort of respond to Pedro's comment, I you know expectations is I can certainly appreciate that perspective of whether or not it's your expectation or whose expectation it is. In terms of recognizing that the legislature and the governor may decide, that's sort of I, I guess I don't see that as sort of being a judgment. That's just sort of a fact. They, they may well do that. I mean, they, just because the right thing to do may be fully funding, there's, it's clearly that there are other options available. And I think all that's just trying to reflect is the fact that even though there's a risk of not fully funding it, they, we recognize the fact that they may make that decision. And that's all we're trying to identify. All righty. So um, Paul, let me get you clicked in here. Thanks. Um, you know, I, I agree with, with what Pedro said, and, and uh, um, I had suggested that language change that, that changed it from it's been Calster's expectation to instead we recognize that the legislature may want to do, the, do that. Um, uh, and I offered that change before I saw the, the new Milliman numbers and the text that accompanied them. Uh, which shows a situation that's uh, gone from $64 billion unfunded liability to 73. Um, and I, th I, think, I think the, and, and it's also um, the reason that I've asked the question as to what, what is the trajectory that gets us to the outcome when we say, our goal is 75 years, 80% funded or 100% funding or whatever. And it shows that what happens is, and it's hard to read the, the tables because they're so so small, but it shows that, that actually we drop down to 50 or 55% funding and stay there for, in some cases, 40 or 50 years. So the question that I have is, is, is not only that we should take out that expect that wording about expectations, and hopefully the other board members will be comfortable with, with that rewrite. But but how how much should we even give credibility to an option other than full funding over thirty years? In other words, if I read the SCR one hundred five the text of SCR 105, um, it says, it asks CalSTRS to develop at least three options to address the long-term funding needs. Um, not to improve them, but to address them. And if we get to, if we're sitting at 50 or 55 percent funding for 40 or 50 or 60 years, and and those numbers, by the way, all those graphs are on the assumption that we have 7.5% funding returns every year. And in fact, during that period of time, we have a big drop in the market, which in a 40 or 50 year period of time is a distinct possibility, as, as we've seen, and as our um, uh, investment consultants have been talking about. Where does that leave us at that point? And so I. I would like to have a little bit more discussion about uh, going a little further on the same point that Pedro raised as to whether this report really should even 
um, entertain as an option that meets the requirements of or the request of the legislature under SCR 105, anything that anticipates a 70 year, five year um, uh, uh, objective. Because, I mean, most of those 75 year scenarios, in 10 years, we're going to be down, it looks to me like at about 50 or 55 percent funding. We're going to stay there for 40 or 50 years. And can we, in as fiduciaries responsible for the funding of this system, be able to say 10 years from now, oh, we're addressing the problem. People say we are at 50 percent funding. Oh, no, we address the problem. No, I don't think we address the problem. So I, I, I don't know whether this is the right time. I would like to hear from, from Milliman, because I also think it's, it's instructive that Milliman <coughs> says in, this re, in the report that Quote, we believe a 30-year amortization of the funding shortfall should be the minimum funding target. And they also reference the California Actuary Advisory Panel, which actually says that the amortization period should generally be less than 25 years. Um, and I'd also like to hear from Fiduciary Council. Nick, Ian, want to come on up? I have Michael in line. Would you like to respond to Paul now or wait until Michael's comments? Do you want me to go first? Sure. Okay. Um, Paul did a really good job of summarizing our report. You know, one of the things he talked about is, you know, if you do these projections and you start dropping down to 50%, well, that's not what's going to happen. Something different is going to happen. Um, and once you start, start dropping below 50%, it is really hard. You know, one bad shock, it is really hard to recover from that. So you're just kind of, you know, it's kind of by a thread. So, uh, Anything that really delays the contribution increase really, you know, causes us some concern. So, I, I mean, I would definitely agree with the uh, comment so far. Um, have you read the report? Oh, yes, I've read the report. I mean, it, it, the reality is, I mean, we appreciate that uh, from an actual perspective, we would just say, you know, put in 20 percent, another 20 percent of pay, you know, today, right. and we'd be much happier. And there's obviously way more factors than that that, that are in play. Right. Uh, but so, yeah, there's nothing in the, I mean, there's nothing in the report that we, we feel is wrong, but there's, you know, things from different perspectives than from our perspective. I was just going to ask, and, and this might be unfair to ask you, so, you know, maybe this is something that I can weigh in on. Mm -hmm. But for me reading it, I think we, by saying we recognize, and, and I agree that we took out expectation, but we recognize that the intent of the legislature might be totally different than what ours is. Do you think we make the point that while we recognize that, we do believe the best thing to do is fully fund it? Well, I think it's in there. I mean, it's not, you know, in bright neon lights. I mean, it does, okay. you know, leave some wiggle room. I, I mean, that was, you know, my opinion from reading it. But right. I, I did like uh, some of the, the late changes about the additional risk if you don't target a, a right. higher funded ratio that you could. Uh, Particularly if it's there gonna be was harder. To, it's going to be harder to recover. And if you wait 10 to 15 years and you don't have strong funding right off the bat, then it's going to uh, could really put the plan at risk. Thank you. I'm. Um, I mean, obviously, the um, the one thing that uh, you couldn't put in as an option is doing nothing. And then everything else um, that you might put in as an option has to be evaluated by Milliman. Um, I, I guess my question is, um, do are there options that are currently in the paper that um, if the legislature adopted those options, Milliman would then come in and tell the board that those are not uh, feasible options uh, in terms of reaching, um, addressing the long-term funding needs and uh, achieving actuarial soundness. Well, I mean, that's going to be it's, it's going to be a tough call. You start getting into gray area. If you came in, I mean, if, if one of the options was, you know, just a 1% of pay increase, then clearly that, 
I mean, that, that almost would put you in a worse position because you would have done something and it wouldn't have done any good. So, you know, that's, you know, and, and then on the opposite end of the spectrum, you know, putting 20% or more of pay in right away, I mean, that's obviously good. But actually sound is, uh, is not really, I mean, it's, it's not really defined. Well, it's defined in a few places, but it's not, uh, but there's various definitions. So it definitely becomes in a gray area. So uh, Paul referenced the California Actual Advisory Panel that Rick sat on, which I'm currently sitting on. Um, it actually doesn't even, I mean, and Rick and Rick and uh, follow up more, but it, it I, in my discussions with them, they just don't even think about fixed rate plans, plans that don't have uh, rates that change. And and even there, they're talking about a, a amortization period that's 25 years or less. Uh, so so really clearly, it's not exactly according it, it the the options and it, even the 30 year option is, isn't even uh, in their their acceptable guidelines, which is, which they make a very clear point that these are not, you know, legal requirements. This is just, you know, some advice that, that they've set up. Um, so GASB obviously had the 30 year, which a lot of people go on, you know, that's kind of going away, but it still is somewhat a standard out in the public community. Um, that's kind of your second thing. Um, what, you know, my clients, what I've recommended is, is clearly been less than 30 years. Um, I mean, if, if you guys went to 30 years, uh, you know, the 30 year fixed, you know, starting in 2014, I mean, I definitely, personally, I would definitely be comfortable with it. I mean, that would be really a strong improvement. Um, anything less is then you start getting in the gray area. Um, it, clearly you're improving the situation. Um, but there's still a good chance that you're going to have to a very good chance. You're going to have to address that down the road and, uh, make, uh, future changes. Ed, you want to weigh in? Yeah. And I guess it sort of comes down to, you know, what the, the what the legislator asks us to do. And, you know, obviously people have different viewpoints of that. I, you know, I think from our perspective, what we felt is the legislature, we wanted to give the legislature the, a broad spectrum of, of possibilities. If all they want us to say is, how do you fully fund the system? There aren't, I mean, you know, other than saying, well, the member pays this amount, the employer pays this amount, and the state pays this amount, or you do it over this period, you know, you do it gradually at 1% increments, 3%. Those aren't really distinct options that we would see. I think we want to look at very distinct options, and that's why we, that's why we structured the report the way we did. You know, I, I think it's important to recognize that the board was not asked to make a proposal or make any sort of recommendation. We're just providing information. If if, if the board felt that they want to sort of highlight their own perspective about what would be better than another approach, I mean, I think that's fine. But I, I guess I wouldn't want to constrain the legislature's or have the board ignore the fact the legislature might look beyond sort of just the, the classic full funding in 30 years approach um, and, and not give them that information about what it means. Because I think it's instructive for them to see if you increase contribution rates by 5%, you're just, you're just kicking the can down the road, as it was popular to say a few years ago. Um, and we want to make sure that information is out there. All righty. Michael? <clears throat> I guess Ed kind of made the point that I was, that I was thinking about, and I want to ask this kind of iron. Um, Pedro called this a fiduciary decision, and I guess in, 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 to a certain extent, um, we've not really drawn a line between what is a recommendation from us as fiduciaries and what is just information from us as the people with all the information. And my question is, can we, in this report, have a section that says, as fiduciaries, this is what we recommend. But as experts, taking off our fiduciary hat, for your information, here are the consequences of these various scenarios so that you, the legislature, can figure out what it is you want to do. Because I think that's what I'm hearing members of the board are looking for. Yeah, I mean, I have no. I can't say that you're required to make a recommendation. I can certainly say that you're permitted to. Um, so in terms of, you know, 
you know, reaching a conclusion about a, a you know, a preferred approach. I think, I think that's totally consistent with your fiduciary duty. You can never really take off your fiduciary hat, um, even if you, you know, provide other options, if you do decide to make a recommendation about one. And the only thing that concerns me is um, that you might make, you might provide an option that, you know, your actuary is, is basically going to say, um, you know, does, doesn't do the job. So, and I don't, I'm not an actuary. That's why I'm asking Nick. I mean, um, you know, he really is, and Rick, I mean, they're really the ones who need to advise you, you know, with respect to whether any of these, and, and Paul seems to, th to think the 75 year one is, is one of those, where if the legislature adopted that, um, they're gonna come in and then tell you, my God, you realize what this means. And it's not going to, you know, the likelihood of you achieving actuarial soundness or um, even even addressing the long-term funding needs of the system uh, isn't being accomplished. So I have no problem with a recommendation. I have no problem with options, but I do have a problem with any option that isn't going to satisfy the actuaries. What I heard Ed saying, though, was these aren't necessarily options that we were saying that the legislature can choose from, we're giving them information on which they can make their own decisions. I mean, the, 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 the example that you were saying, you know, if you <clears throat> increase it by this amount, this result. If you do this, this result. These are not necessarily recommendations. This is just facts and that, that, that you will need in order to make your decision. So I guess the question is, can we, can we divide it up between Here's what we recommend. Here are just some background facts that 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 that, that may help you to, to do your own calculus. Well, and just you know, I, I, all I have to say is it makes me nervous, even um, to provide the legislature with an option that you've been told you you know you can't live with as fiduciaries. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know the California legislature. Um, I don't know any legislature, but. Um, once you put something in writing, uh, you know, it's, it's open for their consideration. And it seems to me, if you don't want them to consider it and adopt it, because you know that your actuaries are going to come in and tell you it doesn't work, you know, that's dangerous. You know, but that's for you to evaluate, not for me to evaluate. I just, but I would just point out that I think it's dangerous for, you know, for this system to send something to the legislature that you have been told is not going to work. You know, you know, there's no such thing. You know, this is a as neutral information. Once, once information is conveyed, I mean, I guess you could say, as Paul might characterize it, well, 75 years is an option. It really doesn't work. We don't really want you to pay attention to it, but uh, you know, we felt you know, a, a, you know, a compulsion to put it in there. I mean, that that to me is not something that you should do. Well, I mean, but part, part of this report oh, says... I'm sorry, Michael, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm taking you off. Why don't you jump okay. in again? Okay. So your mics, come on. That's okay. Um, Sharon, can you... Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm not, not saying Paul's right. I'm no, just no, saying no, if you I all agree. Okay. Well, for example, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong yet, but part of the report says, you know, uh, pay as you go is not... Is, 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 here, here are the implications of that. But we're not... To, to me, that's just information, I guess. I, I guess I, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with, with trying to figure out how to get what Ed's trying to do without running afoul of our fiduciary, not running afoul, but, but in, 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 in concert with our fiduciary obligation. As I said, the clearest one is doing nothing. You know, that obviously I don't think is consistent with your fiduciary duty. And I certainly wouldn't suggest you, you know, make that an option. And the only question I think that's before you with, you know, with what's being sent to the legislature is, are there any other options that are included now in that paper that are close enough to doing nothing that there's a danger that if the legislature accepts that, then at some point down the road, your actuary may tell you it doesn't work and you may have to then be faced with 
you know, what to do about that. So, um, so I'm, if, I, if Michael, if I could jump in. I think the options that are, are within the report that bring us to that point are very clear. That's where it's going to take us. That's a really bad spot to be. So I think that the information that we're providing in the report is very clear that it has to be something other than that. So are you not, I mean, are you not getting that same impression from the report well, or? I, I, you know, I just am always concerned that once you, you know, put something in and call it an option, that people may not pay attention to, you know, the subtlety or, you know, I mean, the report doesn't say this doesn't work. This is, you know, this will blow up the system. We'll never achieve funding. You know, if you want to put that in neon, you know, that would make me more comfortable. But my feeling always is that once you put something in writing and send it to a, you know, the, the body that makes the decision, and here it's the legislature, um, you're better off not even including as an option. If, if you conclude based on your actuary's <coughs> advice that is, you know, if they do that, if they accept it, it's not, you're, it's not going to work. Ed? And I don't know the answer to that. I mean, that's for Nick and Rick. Well, tell you. the one that's, uh, of the four that we identified, the one that's, that's certainly the most problematic is, is the fourth one, um, where we talk, and, and on page 15 of, of the, the hard copy, what it says is it's a five percentage point increase beginning in 2014 would delay the projected date where the program assets are depleted to 2058. And it goes on to say, such an approach would not solve the problem. The legislature would almost certainly have to make further changes at a future date to provide long-term viability of the program. So you're right. If we, I mean, I guess, you know, if we don't, if people just read, you know, tops of sections, they may not catch all that. But I guess there's sort of an expectation is they, they read the thing and we could highlight that in a pullout if necessary. But, and if there's, a, and if there's stronger language that the board feels is more comfortable to sort of make it clear, to make that one stand out from anything else, that's fine too. But I, I just, I, I think given the fact that, you know, there, there will probably be a desire on, on, you know, some, you know, there's always think about what's the least we have to do to address it. We want to make sure that people understand the consequence of that approach. We're not saying by any stretch of imagination, this is a good idea. We can make it clear that it's a really bad idea, but I think to ignore it entirely, I think we would miss an opportunity to educate people about just doing a little bit doesn't get you very far at all. 